next, my talk is called Successful Backyard Birdhouses. Um, before I launch into it, let me uh, go uh, over uh, a couple of things just so you know. First of all, um, questions. If you have any questions, do me a favor and uh, hold the, go ahead and type them as soon as you come up with them. Uh, type them into chat and we have an expert, um, another expert, online, uh, the woman in this picture, Georgette Howington, um, another county coordinator for, uh, she's actually county coordinator for Alameda Contra Costa County, and she's the assistant director for the California Bluebird Recovery Program. Georgette's in the audience right now, and she's going to be answering your questions um, in the chat. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and put them in chat. Um, if they're easy uh, to, to, to go ahead and give you a, a quick answer, she'll, she'll just go ahead and do it. There may be some that she just says, you know what, we'll answer that one live. Um, and that way uh, she can get my take on it or she can go ahead and, uh, um, and just kind of give a, a longer answer. Um, she's got years and years of experience with this just like I do. And um, so uh, we're really lucky and fortunate to have her uh, with us. Um, and then my name is Mike Azevedo. I'm the Santa Clara County Coordinator for the California Bluebird Recovery Program and for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, the Cavity Nesters Recovery Program. So um, the nest spot, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, help out Sequoia Audubon with a Purple Martin project that they have there. And I, I've got Beverly Cronin in because we actually did two of these trainings, one for Santa Clara Valley, the one we're doing now, and then one for Sequoia Audubon we did a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so I'm, I left the card in here because Beverly's in the audience as well, Beverly Cronin is our San Mateo County coordinator for the Bluebird Recovery Program. And, um, the, and they have now a Cavity Nesters Recovery Program for Sequoia Audubon Society. Um, and then I didn't want to forget, Carolyn Knight is from the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, our host. So uh, thank you very much, Carolyn, for doing this for us. Um, so successful backyard birdhouses. The reason that I use this for my title is not because it's the most appropriate title. And the reason I say that is because uh, every one of those words has something that um, I really need to talk about. But um, as you'll see, there are some certain problems with that title, um, even though I, I, I call it that. First of all, the word successful. Um, successful is exactly what we want in a nest box. And unfortunately, when people put up nest boxes, often they're not successful and uh, they, don't, they don't realize it. And uh, so when, um, when you have eggs, like the, the beautiful eggs you have here, the beautiful tree swallow eggs that you see in there, you might be uh, tempted to say, wow, I've done it. I'm successful. This is a successful nest box. But the problem is it's like, it's like uh, saying, I'm gonna go drive to the store. And as soon as you get in the car and turn on the engine, you call it a success. Well, you're not, it's not a success yet. You haven't made it to the store. See, a nest isn't successful until the birds uh, uh, are hatched or, or laid, obviously the eggs are laid, the eggs hatch and the nestlings fledge out of the nest box. That's a successful nest box. And um, unfortunately what happens is people will assume that when they get eggs that they're successful. and um, and the reason that it, it, we have to talk about safety um, of the birds, because a lot of times they'll, they'll lay these eggs and they're not going to hatch for one reason or another. Uh, I'll talk more about that. The next word is bird, backyard. Now, um, the picture there is actually from the uh, Conservatory of Flowers in San Francisco. And as you can imagine, it's beautiful there, right, with all these flowers and, and all this, this, you know, green lawn and a lot of backyards in the same way, right? that you got all this greenery back there and stuff. That does not necessarily mean you have any birds. It doesn't mean you have any insects. A lot of times these are uh, entirely non-native plants that you have there. And that may mean that your uh, backyard is an ecolo ecological dead zone. As, as beautiful as it may be, as, as many you know beautiful flowers and stuff like that, that doesn't mean that you have any food that a bird would want to feed their young. So um, now some of you may have like an oak tree 
or other, uh, other trees that produce the insects that uh, a bird would want to, and then that's great. Then you have, um, you have a place uh, that uh, a bird is gonna wanna um, raise their young, but often um, people assume that it's outside, therefore it must be fine to put up a nest box and their nest box sits empty and they wonder why. And the problem is uh, it has to do with the habitat. The word is all about the habitat. So, um, and then the term birdhouse. Now, the so obviously a birdhouse originally back way back when was probably intended as a house for birds, a place for birds to safely raise their young, but that's not what it is now. The term birdhouse has been corrupted by yard decorations and art projects and um, things that where the priority is no longer on the bird, the priority is on uh, what looks good to us. And, and that's just wrong. That's, that's the wrong attitude for us to, to work with. When we want a uh, birdhouse, when we're gonna put up a birdhouse, we wanna have something that is um, good for the birds. And therefore we have to make it one where the eggs are laid and that those eggs will hatch and that they successfully fledge. Um, because uh, predators are always looking out for these. Now, this is an actual product I found. Um, these these nest these bird houses. These are I um, can't even call this a nest box. These bird houses uh, are not made for even local birds. That's it's got multiple holes and all that, um, which is more of a purple martin style house. Um, but uh, how do you open that up to clean it out? It's just like. So um, unfortunately, there's a lot of these out there that are just not um, really conducive to local birds and uh, doing it safely. And, and as far as the coloring, you know, put a bluebird on there and do you think you can see it? Yeah, because a bluebird doesn't, doesn't blend in to that kind of a house. So um, the problem is that birds have to raise their young in secret. And when they, I say raise their young in secret, what I mean is when you walk up to a nest box and you see a bird and you know that they're going in to, to feed their young, you may notice that they always stop and they look at you and they wait. They don't want you to see them go into their nest. They're trying to be very secretive because they're not playing around. They have to make sure that nobody sees them going into their nest because once the predator knows where their nest is, it's all over they're gonna lose their nest. So um, they have to, to raise their young in secret and their young are actively hunted 24 hours a day, seven days a week by um, cats and snakes and other birds and all kinds of stuff. So um, when we talk about trying to make a nest box that is natural looking and doesn't attract a lot of attention, that's what we're talking about. We're trying to talk about changing our attitudes so that we understand that the birds are a priority, not our own creativity and our own ability to show people what we can do with our woodworking skills. So um, let's talk about the, uh, the word cavity nester. Um, cavities are holes in trees and uh, cavity nesting birds are birds that actually raise their young in cavities. So you can see this uh, hole here was made by a woodpecker um, and uh, the woodpecker probably made that hole in order to build its own nest, and then the uh, other birds can move into it. There's other ways of getting a cavity, though. Um, for example, if you look at this tree stump, you may notice that right in the middle of this tree stump is a great big hole, and that hole came about because the, the heartwood of the tree rotted out. And it meant that there was a fissure running straight up the middle of the, uh, of the tree. And uh, if a branch breaks off, that actually exposes the inside of the tree. Now, the, uh, that means that there's now a hole that goes in. The, the, the actual nest, the, 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 the fissure, they may end up actually putting their nest on the bottom, right on the ground. And then that means that the babies are gonna have to literally fly up and up to the hole in order to get out. But that, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so that's another way of getting a cavity. So a cavity nesting bird is a bird that lives in a, a cavity that's formed somehow 
in a tree. Well, there's a problem with those kind of, of cavities and that is um, any tree that's going to have either a woodpecker hole or a big fissure running up the middle where it's supposed to have heartwood, those trees are not long for this world. And people are worried that they're going to fall on their house. So, or, or their car or another person and they're gonna have to get, they're gonna get sued. So people take down these trees and that's what's happening is we are, are running out of the, the, the birds, at least before we got involved, the birds were starting to run out of housing for places to raise their young. So um, the woodpecker, when it builds its nest, it's a, consider, it's a primary cavity nester because woodpeckers are able to build their own nest. They don't need anybody else to clear out of their nest first. They can go ahead and put their nest wherever they want. So a primary cavity nester is a bird that isn't dependent on, on anybody else. They are kind of dependent on a tree that's, uh, that's you know, aged and not, not doing all that well. But as far as uh, they, they, they're not dependent on anybody else to give them housing. But a secondary cavity nester, they must have somebody, they, they must have another source out there. They're, they're looking for a place to raise their young and they're not able to build it themselves. Um, and then a bluebird is an indicator species. And the reason I say that is because obviously uh, bluebirds are iconic. We, we have them in uh, Disney movies and, and things like that. They're always, whenever there's a, you know, a bird that's carrying around Snow White's uh, dress. It's always, a bluebird is one of them. And so bluebirds have always been attractive and people have always seen them and, and said, wow, there's a, um, the bluebird. And, and if uh, maybe they see them on their way to school, they're kind of um, flitting around in the, uh, in the fields. And when they're not there anymore, people notice. People, people notice that they no longer see the beautiful bluebirds that they used to see when they were kids. Well, um, the thing is now we have the all these bluebird societies and things like that, but keep in mind that all the stuff that's happening to the bluebird is happening to all those other birds. The bluebird is the one we notice. That's why it's an indicator species. The things that, um, that we don't wanna simply look at it as we need to help the bluebird, we need to help the bluebird and all of the other cavity nesting birds that it represents. Uh, habitat destruction is obviously if you take a, uh, uh, a meadow and you turn it into a parking lot, then you are going to be really destroying a lot of habitat. That's going to be a real problem for pretty much anything that lives out there, right? But bluebirds are a little bit different because they, it's not just a matter of, uh, you know, just bulldozing everything. Although that, like I said, that's a problem. But a lot of times you'll have an area that has everything that a bluebird needs except for a place to raise its young because we keep taking those out. We keep cutting down those trees. And so that's why we can actually move in, put in a nest box and give the bluebird what, that, what is losing. Now I've got, a, I asked my friend to, to write a, a cartoon for me and this is, uh, this is it. It's uh, the male bluebird saying, let me get this straight. You want to cut down my home so it doesn't fall on your car? And the female says, ask him if we can live in his car. So the bluebird, um, the, the nest boxes, can, the, the cavity that they're raising their young, it's considered the limiting factor. That means that um, if you think about a habitat, habitat is the, the water, shelter, space, places to raise their young, all the things that any animal is going to need in order to survive and, and to reproduce. Um, in order to get all those things, um, whatever it is that there is the least of, that is the limiting factor. That's the thing that's going to mean that the carrying capacity, the number of bluebirds, for example, that can be supported on a given piece of property, um, it, it's, it's the, the limiting factor is what is going to control that carrying capacity. And if that, that limiting factor is nested is uh, nesting opportunities, and there are no nesting opportunities, the carrying capacity is basically zero. They're, you're not gonna have any more bluebirds. So um, the California Bluebird Recovery Program and the North American Bluebird Society, as I said, um, have been out here for quite a while, for decades. 
um, helping the birds and uh, they're wildly successful because we're seeing bluebirds in places that we've never seen them before all the time. We're, we're always getting new, um, new reports of, of uh, bluebirds moving into new places. Um, and I know that the same is true for tree swallows and violet green swallows. Not so much for some of the other birds that maybe we aren't actually trying actively as much to help, but, um, but we really should. And I, I honestly think that they're in better shape than they would have been had we not been actively trying to help them. The Santa Clara Valley of Audubon Society and the Sequoia Audubon Society, as I said, both have cavity nester recovery programs now. So what is a cavity nester recovery program? A cavity nester recovery program is um, basically uh, something that's out there to help people that want to help bluebirds but don't necessarily know how. And remember I said that if you had a, a backyard that isn't conducive to native birds, that um, you may not know what, um, you, what are you supposed to do? Well, even if your backyard isn't, the, maybe you live in an apartment, maybe you live in a, 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 a backyard that is all concrete or something, I don't know. But, or, uh, but if it turns out that um, you can't have a, a box there down the street in, uh, there's a park, cemetery, uh, open spaces, schoolyards, corporate campuses, somewhere nearby is a place that is gonna um, be able to accommodate these native birds. And so even if you can't put up a nest box in your backyard, you can put it up in these places here. And what a cavity nest recovery program does is to help you with that job of uh, figuring out where to put the boxes. So let me tell you more about that. So. Let's say you wanna put up a nest box at say a park. Well, there's a management agency that's in charge of that, whether it's a cemetery or a county park, a city park, um, a, uh, a, you know, any of these places are gonna have somebody that's in charge and would be able to, to give the go ahead um, for you to put up nest boxes. Don't just run down there and start putting stuff up on private property or corporate campuses. You wanna get permission. So what you want to do is uh, go ahead and contact a management agency and tell them what your idea is. Um, they may be really hip to the idea and they may not be so much. So what you want to do is uh, go ahead and contact a management agency. You can contact Audubon first um, and uh, tell them what you have in mind. And, um, but often it's best if you can go ahead and make the contact first because they want to know that, that the person who's contacting them and saying that they're going to put up a nest box, they want to know that you have a certain amount of commitment to this and you're not just going to put them up and abandon them. So obviously um, most of these places are going to ask you to sign waivers because nobody wants to be sued if you end up getting hurt. Um, and uh, a lot of times there are actually volunteer groups, like for example, the SFPUC or the uh, any you know city or county, a lot of times they'll have volunteer groups that you can actually join and do all of your work as a mem as one of their volunteers, which is great. That's what I do for the Santa, Cl Santa Clara County Parks. My nest box trail is in a county park and um, I am a, an actual Santa Clara County volunteer. And that way I'm able to do all of this under their auspices. And then Obviously, um, there are going to be times when they're going to say, but we need you to have insurance. Audubon may provide insurance certificate. Now, um, they do. I, I just don't want to be the one to speak for Audubon. So um, if, you, if, uh, if, you, if you need an, an insurance certificate, go ahead and bring it up to either Sequoia Audubon or Santa Clara Valley Audubon and see what they say. Um, and then they're going to have questions. Um, for example, they may say, well, what kind of bird species do you expect? To, uh, to, to, because I've actually been asked these questions. And um, there are other questions. Uh, we can help you with that. that. That's what the county coordinators do is we have gotten good at looking at a piece of property and, and identifying the different things on that property that would draw in native cavity nesting birds. And we can figure out what kind of birds you can expect to see there and we can answer the question when they wanna know um, and many of the other questions that they ask. 
um, they're going to want you're going to want to know the benefits of cavity nesting birds and all of the cavity nesting birds benefit humans greatly. For example, bluebirds um, eat ground dwelling insects that live in your lawn, right? It would be much better to use bluebirds to eat all the grubs that are trying to eat your lawn than to put pesticides all over it, insecticides that are going to go down into the rivers and streams um, and poison the fish that they're going to end up back in our water supply. We, we don't want that. We want a beautiful biological insect control or um, uh, tree swallows. Violet green swallows actually uh, eat mosquitoes. We don't want mosquitoes, right? It would be better to use that than uh, just sit there and slap ourselves. So you want to know the benefits of cavity nesting birds. And, and even the ones that I didn't mention, all of them do benefit humans in one way or another. Um, and then why, why do I have mowing and maintenance? Well, the reason I have mowing and maintenance is because that's something that the agency is going to be concerned with. And they're going to want you to have the attitude that you don't want to inconvenience them. Well, they're going to be uh, they're going to be running around and mowing things, and they want to know that you're not going to put a nest box in such a way that it's going to make it so they can't mow, um, they the, or or do whatever other kind of maintenance they need to do. You know, um, there are things that uh, there are activities that are going to happen, and if you put a nest box right where that activity that they need to happen, uh, you know. It's going to be uh, it's going to be an inconvenience, and that's not going to be a good thing. In upcoming construction, did you know that every bird species has a radius around which it is not supposed to be? Um, there's supposed to be no construction happening. So let's say you go and you put a like for example um, the rotary play garden. Unfortunately, we had a nest box right by the rotary play garden, and when they started. Uh, work on the Rotary Play Garden in San Jose, we discovered that there was a nest box that we put there and it had a nest in it. It delayed uh, construction for a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, it's one thing if a bird puts a nest in a bush and that happens. But if we put a nest box right there, then that's just, you know, poor planning. So you want to you want to be careful about that kind of thing. Uh, they're going to want to know who's coming onto your property. They're probably going to want to know how many visits you expect to make per year. Um, the schedule, when do you expect to maybe always show up on Mondays or something like that. And then um, uh, GPS locations of nest boxes. And by the way, um, Audubon would also like GPS locations of nest boxes because unfortunately, sometimes people just disappear. <laughs> and it would be nice for us to know where your nest boxes are. So if it turns out you... Uh, forget about it or, or, or aren't able to continue, we know where your nest boxes are and we can have somebody else take over. And then the level of human activity. Now, um, this is something you're going to want to know. Um, but for example, like uh, in a picnic area, there are a lot of times when unsupervised kids are around and unsupervised kids can be real problems for uh, nest boxes. They, I've seen them beaten up with baseball bats and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so uh, you can still have them there, but you want to do certain things in order to protect them from a vandalism. Uh, and then uh, of course, habitat. Habitat is really important in determining what kind of nest boxes you put up and where they're put up. And again, this is all stuff that the Cavity Nesters Recovery Program can help you determine. We'll help you. We'll figure out where to put up the nest boxes. We'll come down and, and, uh, and tell you how to mount the nest boxes and give you whatever hel other help that, you can, uh, that we can. So these are, uh, uh, they're, they're bird houses, theoretically in, in quotes. Um, they're bird houses that uh, were placed down at Edenvale Garden Park. Um, but back in uh, 1980, uh, the, there was a, a Western themed um, amusement park called Frontier Village down there. And I never actually visited there. My wife did um, when she was a kid. It closed in 1980, Great America opened in 1976. That's not a coincidence. And, um, and so somebody, uh, even when I went down there, none of this was here. Um, I got nostalgic for the place when I worked at Edenville Garden Park. And I actually went to the California room and I discovered all these different buildings and stuff like that 
that used to be on the property. And um, you know what? I wasn't alone. All the people that the old employees that used to work there, they really got into it. And so what they decided to do was to put up these birdhouses that look just like the buildings that uh, used to be on the property. And as you can see, they're beautiful. They're, they're great remembrance pieces of all the buildings that used to be there on the property. What they aren't is good birdhouses um, because uh, the, we were asked to come down and, and, and figure out if maybe we could help uh, by monitoring them. But you know what? How are you supposed to clean them out? This real, I mean, they're, they're all mounted on eight foot poles in the middle of a clearing. And, um, and then they have at the bottom a sign. And on that sign, it says um, that they expect the following birds to be using the nest box. Well, I was I'm, I'm like looking at going, well, how do they know that a downy woodpecker might be using this nest box? Well, the reason is because they went and they got the dimensions and the whole size that a downy woodpecker would want in their box. But that's about it. What they didn't do was to actually figure out what a downy woodpecker would want in a nest box. It wouldn't want it up in the middle of a clearing. Um, you know, it's it's just all these birds, like the white breasted nuthatch. Uh, first of all, the downy woodpecker is actually a very rare bird in a nest box. We do have them, but maybe two or three um, over a couple of years um, throughout the entire county. Um, the white-breasted nuthatch is a very secretive bird that does not like to fly out into a clearing. It needs, it would want to have a nest box that is right near the trunk of the tree. The western bluebird needs grassland. The house wren likes a thicket. The chest up back chickadee likes a canopy overhead. All of these things are things that are not satisfied by what they put up. And the point I'm trying to make is that all these bird species need something. They, they want something. So we have these, box, these uh, nest boxes that people have been putting out there without any idea of what our local birds are looking for. The people that, in, that, that suggested you put this up, like I said, it's a nice yard decoration, but it's not gonna be very good for, uh, for the nest, the, the, uh, our birds. So um, it's uh, just something to keep in mind. If you, if you look at these, these boxes, you realize that the, the entrance hole is too large, um, things like that. In this case, it's a multi-nester. Uh, there's all these different, well, there's only one bird um, that is gonna use something like that um, for the most part, one native bird. And that's our purple martin. And the Western purple martin is not gonna use that box. So uh, this is a section, suction cup box um, that was uh, on the market for uh, several years ago. It's called the My Spy Birdhouse. Um, you can still buy some here and there for $1.98. Um, they, they used to be 15 bucks, but uh, the point is that uh, they were a failure when they first came out and they're a failure now. Um, and the reason I say that is because uh, the, for, first of all, suction cups, they, they, they claim they're a high weather sub, all weather suction cups. That, yeah, that, that's wrong. All, they're no different than any other suction cups you've ever had fail on you. But this time there are lives at stake. And, uh, the, uh, and you know that they're gonna fail right when the nestlings are at their oldest, if they were ever gonna move in there, but they wouldn't. So, um, uh, so what you wanted, uh, the, and, and of course, you're putting them on a window. Birds don't know what windows are. Um, there's actually an entire list of reasons why these boxes are horrible. Um, any suction cup birdhouse is horrible. Please don't use them. Um, now, this is a, a really nice looking birdhouse, as you can imagine. There's only one problem. You can't open it. So uh, when you... Whenever you go and you look at a nest box that is uh, being sold anywhere, and I mean even Audubon, but or or some of that like, um, there are many stores where they really know what they're doing, but unfortunately sometimes they end up having a box that they shouldn't necessarily be selling, but they uh, they end up having to sell because they're a business. Um, 
And so what's, what I'm saying is pick up the box and look at it and inspect it and make sure you can open it and make sure it's a good nest box and don't buy it if it's not. Um, because, and, and that goes wherever you get it, even the places that, that really should know. Um, now, this is a, a picture of a, a bird. And the reason I want you to see, I want you to see how that bluebird is holding on to that nest box right there. Okay. And also notice how that bird blends in with that nest box. That's the kind of camouflage that we're hoping will happen when you have a nest box. The female is a little bit more drab. Um, obviously, you're going to have a male that, that is a little bit brighter. Um, going in. But the one to really worry about is the female. If she can blend in, then we're in pretty good shape. So why, after I go talking about how all these requirements that the birds have, what, why would they end up in a bad nest box anyway? And they will. Um, just the, That's why I'm saying these eggs. The eggs show up and people say, oh, I'm a success. I'll, obviously, I have a great nest box. Well, that's not necessarily true because the birds are desperate. They are driven to reproduce. They really want to reproduce. They really want to have babies. And um, they're going to look, they're going to lay their eggs in the best place that they can find. And obviously, the, uh, the oldest, most experienced birds are going to get the best places. And the ones that are in the, the, the worst places are the ones that are younger and inexperienced, first year birds, just trying out. And they're going to take whatever they can. And chances are they're going to lose their nest. And we can help them by giving them good housing, not bad housing. Um, you want the ability to clean and monitor a nest. Now, um, I want to point out that a, uh, a box Sometimes, let me grab uh, this. I don't know if you can see this. Um, this nest box opens from the side. Uh, so like this. Now, this is Lee Pauser's box. It's actually open downward. Many others actually open upward. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then there are boxes that actually open from the front. Um, and there's nothing wrong with those either. Now, if you were looking for a design and you said, well, I want to design my own, which one would be better? Um, I, I think that uh, Lee Pauser's box has something to, uh, to speak for it. For example, you open it up a little bit, you look inside, you're able to, you're good, right? Whereas if you're going to be opening a box up from the side, you have to open it all the way up in order to see what's going on. Now, all of my boxes are the type that open upward. So um, I'm not going to say that there's anything wrong with those. The ones I also have boxes that open from the front. Um, but I'm going to recommend side opening boxes, whether they open from the bottom or from the top. Um, and then there are those that open from the top. They're harder to clean out. They're great to take pictures of, but they're harder to clean out. And uh, so um, I guess also the birds, there's no way the birds are going to fall out of them, but I've never had a bird fall out. So um, anyway, uh, you want to be, be able to open the box up and clean it and look inside and see what's going on. Um, predator guards. Now, uh, if you look at this box here, um, notice that there's a piece of wood on the front. If I was a, 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 a starling or something and I couldn't really fit into the box, but I wanted to reach my head in in order to try and uh, and, and get the babies, um, the more wood that is between me and them, the better. The more wood between me and them, the better, because it's going to be harder for me to reach all the way in. Um, and you can actually have like a two by four instead of just that little bit of wood. And, um, and I have two by four predator guards on some of my houses. Now, this is a Noel guard. And Georgette swears by them. So um, Noel guards are basically a uh, hardware cloth. It's just you, they, uh, the, there are construction plans for these. Um, you just look up Noel guard, N-O-E-L guard. And um, 
and basically, you know, it looks awkward for the birds, but it's not. They literally land in there, and they hop right over and they hop right in. They have no problems whatsoever entering this. However, snakes and um, certain other, like cats um, and, and certain other uh, birds and things um, do have a hard time with it. And so it works really well as a predator guard, um, something to prevent predation. Um, and then this is a baffle, a stovepipe baffle. Now, unfortunately, um, this nest box is leaning and it shouldn't be leaning. It should be up with that, pred that baffle being uh, straight up and down um, and the, the, the whole pipe being up straight up and down. But the idea here is that a snake would see the nest box from the, the hole from a distance. And when it comes in, it crawls up the pipe, ends up inside the stovepipe baffle and doesn't, can't figure out how it's supposed to get up to the hole. Um, larger snakes, the, the largest of the snakes are able to figure out their way of getting around it, but it actually does um, reduce predation um, by doing that. And you can actually have a nest box that um, is uh, has both a knoll guard and a stovepipe baffle on it. Um, there's one thing the 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 knoll guard cannot be on a, a front opening nest box because it'll hit the roof. Um, so that that's another reason why you'd want to have uh, a side opening nest box. Um, no perch. And again, you look at this bird; it's not sitting on a perch. It's it's holding on and it thrusts itself in, has no problem getting in without a perch. You know who needs a perch? The predators, the birds that want to reach in and grab those babies and pull them out. Um, so you don't want a perch on your nest box. And curves. Now, if you look at what this is, uh, it, it, because of the angle, it may be kind of hard to figure out what this is. This is actually uh, the, the nest box sitting at an angle um, but you see the entrance hole. We're looking at it from inside the nest box and underneath the hole of the nest box right around here. Um, this is a piece of wood with grooves cut into it and it's glued underneath the entrance hole. Now you can do the same thing by simply taking a nail and scoring underneath the nest box. This is called curves, but it could be just called a ladder. And the reason that a ladder, that, a, that curves are good is because there's certain kind of birds, the, specifically the, um, the violet green swallow that has its legs further down its body and it is, has a hard time actually making its way up. Now, um, normally actually when the nest is in, the nest is actually gonna meet the bottom of this curve. So, that's why it's okay to have, uh, have it start like this because the nest is gonna be all around the, the base of the, of the box here. Um, so the violet green swallow, what the problem is, is they have a hard time making it up to the entrance hole. Um, and, and you say, well, why would that be? Well, it's because they're not, they weren't evolved to use a straight up and down slick box like that they um, came from natural, uh, the, the natural entrances from uh, either a rotted out tree or from a uh, woodpecker hole. In, the, in both cases, there's like little toe holds and places for them to grab their, their, uh, feet, their foothold. So that's what curves are for. The proper dimensions is important um, because uh, you want it to be no bigger then uh, necessary. Um, you don't want a big profile. You don't want the nest box to be easily seen. Um, and you don't want it any smaller because of course the birds are in there practicing their flying lessons. They're gonna be hitting each other in the, in the head and, and hitting the walls and stuff like that. So you want the proper dimensions um, for the birds you expect. And the entrance hole, you want the entrance hole to be the proper dimensions for the birds you expect too. Um, because you want the hole to be no bigger than the bird species you're expecting. For example, um, the white-breasted nuthatch 
doesn't need a hole any bigger than an inch and a quarter. <clears throat> and um, that's great. But so if you were expecting a white breast nut hatch, go ahead and use an inch and a quarter entrance hole. And that way it excludes bluebirds and house sparrows and things like that. The biggest issue is the house sparrows because they'll come in and they'll kill the adult bird. Um, and so you want you want it no bigger than than what they need. But what if you've got you want bluebirds? Well, if you want bluebirds, you're going to have to have an inch and a half hole, and that's a problem because house sparrows can go in, but starlings cannot because starlings require a two inch hole. So if you have uh, the entrance hole, you want the entrance hole for the species you expect, and that's why putting up the proper nest box is so important. <clears throat> and then you want it sturdy. Now, the reason you want it sturdy is because um, raccoons will actually go up and rip the, rip the roof right off of it if they can. And they are very strong. So you want it so that it is not going to come apart um, easily. Um, drainage. Now, uh, you don't want a human nest box. You need to have a way of draining any water that does get in there. Um, and these triangles that you see over here um, are actually just cut right off the edge of the floor. So the floor is a square and then you just cut them off and you say, well, aren't those kind of big? They're not big because when the bird goes and puts in that nest, it covers those up. The water can go out, the chicks and the eggs are fine. Overhang. <clears throat> Obviously, um, you're, you're going to want to overhang to prevent rain from going in, and it can prevent some predation from birds that might sit, stand on top and try and um, curl their heads under in order to get to it. The overhang makes it more difficult. They lose their balance and fall off, squirrels, things like that. Um, and then ventilation. Obviously, now this is uh, the, the top along, the, um, along here. Obviously, um, when you have a door that's in there, you want to have a certain amount of, uh, of distance in there, but some of that is going to be for ventilation. Some people just put in, uh, they drill holes for ventilation if they didn't leave that gap like that. Ventilation is very important. Um, so, and uh, that's today's lesson. So, um, what we covered today was the priorities, which is safety for the birds. We covered the natural resources concepts of limiting factor and, and uh, cavity net and uh, uh, kept carrying capacity, things like that. <clears throat> we defined cavity nesting birds. We talked about California Bluebird Recovery Program and the Cavity Nester Recovery Program. And we talked about how to set up your own nest box trail and the good nest box. Next lesson, which is uh, coming up, I think it's next Wednesday, we talk about how to mount nest boxes, the challenges the birds face, um, why and how you monitor the nest boxes, and the species specific placement uh, that you would do for the different species that we encounter around here. So um, as far as resources go, um, we now have a much more user-friendly um, website for the California Bluebird Recovery Program. It's called cbrp.org, and you can go there for information. Um, you can also go to either uh, sequoiaaudubon.org or scvas.org for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. In that last um, website down there, cialis.org, that is run by a woman from Connecticut, um, who uh, she joined the same email list that I did way back like 10 years ago that was run by Cornell. And what she did was she, um, it, was, it was for uh, people who are new to the art of nest box monitoring and people would ask questions and you had all these experts from around the nation, um, including me. And so we would answer based on our best, uh, our best efforts and what she did was she took all those questions and she took all the answers and she put them all together in a really cool website that talks about pretty much anything 
you would want to know um, about uh, nest box monitoring. It's a little bit centered towards the east because a lot of things are, but um, she's done a great job and it is definitely well worth checking out if you have questions about different birds and, and things like that. So, uh, Georgette, did we uh, get any, uh, any questions? We did get questions. One question, uh, you're muted. Can you unmute? Um, Mike, we go. just got we just got one request um, that someone call Yuki back or actually email because she's interested in getting a uh, a nest box uh, for her uh, backyard if possible. Uh -huh. So and she's in Santa Clara, so I'll give you her email address. And Excellent. we have another another question that just popped up from Kristen. She lives by the Los Alamitos Creek Trail in Almaden Valley, which is managed by the Water District. And she wants to know if there are any existing nest box trails there. Do you know, or does Carolyn know? I would have to, um, to look at our records to see if anybody's actually turning in data for okay. Los Alamitos Creek Trail. I do know that it's, it's, it's fairly long. And even if we, uh, I know there isn't one that goes the whole stretch of it. Um, and uh, so as far as uh, Yuki goes, I think that, um, that if we could put her in touch with Carolyn, Carolyn's email address, can I just, should I just give her? Well, I, I, I got Yuki's email address and okay. Kristen, oh, here, let me ask Kristen here. Um, I'll ask her to leave her email address also, Kristen. Well, let me let me point out that uh, that uh, because there may, might be other people that are that are thinking about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn's email address is programs right, at scbas.org. Hold on, hold on, Carolyn. Carolyn Knight. Knight. K N I G H T. Email is programs programs at scvas okay dot org okay and um and so carolyn will be able to uh um to to deal with the the actual nest box request okay good and um and then let's say you're listening to this and you're saying um you know i I'm maybe more, I may be interested in um, setting up my own nest box trail somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are, you can go ahead and drop Carolyn a line and, and tell her. And um, what we're going to want to do, what, you know, one thing I don't want to do, I, I'm, I'm afraid of, is I'm afraid that we're going to set people up in a nest box trail that's far away from home. What we want to do is try and get you a nest box trail that's near your home because uh, there is burnout, we don't want burnout. So um, if we can get something that's nearby, then um, we don't end up, you know, having for, you know, every time you go um, check your nest box, you have to take an hour drive. We don't want that. So um, that's why we'd want to go ahead and set you up. But there might be a nest box trail that's been um, abandoned or there's a nest box monitor who's put in their notice that they're not able, but we do have some that have said, you know what, I, I can't, um, I, I'm gonna have to give it up. Um, a lot of uh, times what they'll, yeah. Another question. Tim mm -hmm. is asking, do you know who maintains the boxes on Permanente Creek in Shoreline Park? I should start writing down these because, uh, so we got permanent I, creek. Sorry, uh, Mike, um, I can actually answer that one. Uh, the boxes on permanent creek are monitored by the uh, biologists um, that work at Shoreline Park. That's part of their conservation effort. So this one, uh, Los, the other one was at Los Alamitos, I think, right? Um, OK, so. Um, so as I was saying, go ahead and, uh, and, and drop Carolyn a line. Um, you're not committing to anything. Uh, if you're interested in maybe um, setting up a nest box trail 
or taking one over. Um, we also have nest box monitors that are already out there that might be willing to um, give you a tour um, to show you their nest boxes um, so that you can see how basically how it, how it's done. And um, so, uh, because, you know, actually touching it, um, touching the nest boxes, it's, it's a whole different story than just hearing about it in a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation. So um, we have that to offer as well. So um, like I said, any of that, if you wanna just go ahead and let Carolyn know what's on your mind, um, that would be great. Um, as far as, you know, if you wanna go ahead and try it, putting them up in your backyard, we have more information next week on uh, the challenges of uh, just, you know, having this box up. So I hope you do show up for that training as well because you know there's a lot more to learn so there you go mm -hmm.